Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast. To join a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice, head to xyadvisor.com. G'day, g'day. How's it going? Clayton here from XY Advisor with Michael Curie. Um, Michael actually reached out and said, mate, like, uh, I'd love to, if I could, share some with, you know, some stuff with advisors just around working from home. And you obviously had a really positive upbeat about, you know, the, the struggles that we're going through at the moment. So I thought you'd be a really good um, conversation to have and podcast to have. So thank you so much for finding the time. Thanks for having me. Mate, it's, uh, it's good. And uh, so I guess getting into it, you've been working home for quite some time. You've got a bit of a remote team all set up and you're yes. pretty comfortable in terms of how you were operating before and how you're operating now. But obviously there was that transition period from the time that you previously weren't working remote to, to how, you know, how you've got it set up now. How long did it take you to become comfortable? I would say it's, it took me a while to be quite honest with you. Um, I'm definitely, I'd say I'm 95% there at the moment. Um, as we've, had, we've had an actual office, a physical office for the last four years. Um, but even since having that office, I've sort of been trying to work from home where I can. Just more for lifestyle balance and especially with the kids and just to make it a bit easier that way as well. Um, the working from home has probably been about 10 years since I have been working from home. So I'd probably say it took me a good three years to properly feel like I sort of knew what I was doing. Interesting. Um, so I've, I've spent a bit of my career working from home as well. Um, it's definitely, it's an interesting sort of headspace thing. Uh, I, I sort of was able to do it for six months and that was every day for six months before I sort of just went a little bit, um, you know, stir crazy. Yeah. Um, but there's, the, you know, the way that we've broken it down in terms of how we're putting this work from home tour on. So we've got communication, operations and acquisitions. Um, let's start with sort of maybe at the top in terms of communicating with yourself, with your family, you know, that sort of that internal in the house communication. How do you communicate with yourself and with your family to sort of come up with, I guess, uh, boundaries, but also, you know, stay stay in the game if that's how yeah. if that's how you consider it it's uh, th that's probably the most important part of this whole thing to be quite honest with you because when the way i thought i've never been in a corporate environment full-time ever i think to be honest with you um but i just sort of pictured myself if i was in a corporate office around other people how i would act what time i'd have to be at the office etc when i would take my breaks and all the rest of it and i'd sort of the way i work is i sort of pretend i have a manager or i have somebody there telling me what to do, but really it's obviously myself. And the, as far as a family's concerned, um, and this sort of would apply to somebody even if they didn't have a family, but it's the sort of to set guidelines and times and sort of at the start of the day to work out, okay, today I'm going to work from this time to this time. I'll take a break at this time and that's my day. And by doing that, I found, first of all, it sort of sets an expectation. If you do have a partner and children, it sort of sets that expectation so that they know when you're working and when you're not working. I found that was one of the biggest struggles because the kids would see me and be like, oh, daddy's home. But no, daddy's not home. Daddy's working. And same thing with my wife. Oh, can you look after the kids? Can you change the nappy? And I'm like, no, I'm working. But she's like, but you're home. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it was like a bit of a circle that we kept going around. But it, it's, it's at that point now where I sort of set my times in this, at the start of the day so that the expectations are the same for everyone. Um, but even if it was just me by myself, it's setting my own expectations. So I've got some accountability or something to follow, I guess, just like we do with our clients. Um, otherwise, the flip side I found of not having the structure in the day is, oh man, it, it's 12 o'clock. You look back and you think, okay, how much work have I actually done? And you find that you've literally done only 45 minutes of work in that whole day. And the rest was just you walking upstairs to get snacks and answering a couple of phone calls and all the rest of it. So I found having that discipline and having that time and that structure, as I said, just makes it so much easier. And that way, when the day's finished, you could sort of look back and think, okay, did I make the most of today? Um, did I actually do eight hours of work? That's my other thing as well. Um, if I did more, it's a reminder to sort of just take it easy as well. And if, as I said, at the same time, I look back and think, man, today wasn't productive at all. I'd sort of figure out what I did wrong or how I could change things for the next day. Interestingly, what were some of the main problems that you found you were having? Um, initially, you mean? Yeah. Um, I think it was 
that getting distracted. Um, I found myself literally spending half my day doing nothing but checking emails. Um, I think in my first three months of being self-employed, I racked up about, I don't know, three years worth of CPD points for every single webinar that I was registering for. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, so because again there was no one there sort of on my back but uh, when I sort of stepped back and get, looked at what I was doing and how productive I was being um, I think that was yeah that, that was a massive eye-opener um, the other thing as well was um, sort of knowing where to start and for me having a to-do list um, is a game changer it is a massive game changer and I know a lot of people have to-do lists um, do you obviously I'm guessing you use some sort of to-do list system or app mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I mean, I just write everything. I'm pretty old school. Oh, I just write okay. on a, in, a, in a notepad. <laughs> okay. You would love this then. So I've got an app that I use. It's called Any.Do. Oh. I know there's Wonderlist. There's all these other ones. But Any.Do, what's really cool about it is you just put in what you need to do. And at the start of the day, you press a button that says plan my day. And it literally comes up with every single task. And then you then select, okay, I'm going to do that today. You can knock it off to tomorrow, two days or next week. And what it then does is it narrows it down to the top 10 things that you should be doing that day. And then I just put them in order and then I just tackle one at a time. And I found just like going to the gym, most people hate doing legs. Mm. Same thing with this. I found <laughs> if I start my day doing the stuff that I hate doing, um, at least that's out of the way. Um, and then all the stuff I actually enjoy doing is sort of after that. So it's, that's why they say you should do legs on Mondays because at least you, you'll get it done. Otherwise, <laughs> the end of the week will come when you haven't done legs. Man, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Cool. That, that's some really good uh, pieces of advice. Staying on communication, um, let's talk to communicating externally. So with clients, um, yes. your, I mean, everyone does phone calls, everyone does emails, um, everyone does, uh, you know, Zoom calls or whatever these days. I think it's, you know, especially now that we're in this pandemic, everyone's very rapidly moving to this. Um, are you using any other tools or is it just kind of you're trying to keep a BAU or, or do you have anything sort of up your sleeve that you use not just with new clients and onboarding, but also, you know, uh, ongoing older clients? For me, definitely Zoom. Um, Zoom's worked out really well, especially sharing my screen. I found that works well when going through an SOA with a client, for example, they could see everything and it's, it's a lot easier that way. It's a, a bit more engaging, I should say. Um, up until the pen, this whole pandemic situation, um, which by the way, I'm, I, I don't know about you, but I'm sick of talking about it. I think. Oh man. <laughs> it's literally, nah. it's literally the first two minutes of every single phone call I've had for the last three months. Yeah. Yeah. No, hundred um, percent. Especially with parents. It's like, uh, you don't want pregnant women look at each other and just nod and they both know what each other's going through. <laughs> I think for parents, it's the same thing. We just look at each other. We're like, yeah, I feel yeah. your pain, man. I feel yeah. your pain. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> because we didn't realize how much energy our kids had. Um, but, um, so for me, before the whole pandemic thing, um, not too much, to be honest with you. Not to, I was really doing it old school, um, printing SOAs and seeing the client and them signing everything on paper and seeing them face-to-face. Um, I love face-to-face. And as I, since having the office about three, four years ago now, maybe, um, that's been very handy because, again, um, a big transition for me was working from home initially and struggling to justify paying X amount per month for an office. Yep. But I just did the maths and I worked out that I'm going to be a lot more efficient with my time and it's worked because I've literally saved myself on average, I'd say two hours a day of travel at least. Yeah. At least. And two hours a day is 14 or you say 10 hours a week. That's literally one whole work day, you know? Yeah. Um, man. So there's that. Um, but since this whole pandemic thing's been happening, um, DocuSign, I started using last week signed up for a trial yep um and it's changed everything for me as far as getting in paperwork back from clients because my average turnaround for paperwork from clients is about four weeks <laughs> if yep. i posted it to them which i really would do but if i sent it to them four weeks because think about it by the time they remember to print it and then remember oh i don't have ink and get ink and then print printer <laughs> doesn't work get it from work left it at work come back get it sign it leave it on the kitchen bench for two weeks i keep reminding them so eight brutal. Text, <clears throat> yep. Eight text messages later, they've finally sent it through. And then by the time I actually get it, it's filled out wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> with DocuSign, I've got a client, for example, last week, I've been waiting for him four weeks to send me an authority form for us just to, we're doing a review. So we have to call up a super fund again, waiting four weeks for this authority form and um, <clears throat> within in an investment change form for another client. And 
sent it through DocuSign and within two hours I had it signed back to me. So yeah, wow. Yeah. Big difference. And I mean, it sounds like everyone's been using it except for me, to be honest with you, but no, no, but that's a huge improvement, right? That's a huge improvement. Really? It really is honestly, because it saves me those phone calls that time and it just makes things so much more efficient, so much more efficient. Um, and yeah. And like the fact that you could literally put where you want clients to sign, I think that's even better because again, instead of sending them the paperwork and putting sticky notes and yeah, but plus it's more secure instead of sending posts that's going to get lost. At least it goes straight to their email. Man, hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, DocuSign's definitely, uh, I've, I've, I've seen quite a lot of, um, conversation about that recently on XY. Um, but it's, I'm glad to hear that it's had such a substantial improvement for you. And in terms of, um, communication with your internal team, so you have a bit of a remote uh, working situation. What are you using and what do you find is uh, works well after, you know, the amount of years that you've been doing it? What works well in uh, handling a remote team? What's up? Well, we've got a What's WhatsApp that? app for the group. Yeah. And that works out really well, really, because it sort of gets to everyone's phones and people can turn off notifications if they just don't want them after hours or if it bothers them too much. Um, but I found that really works. Um, and old school email. Um, cool. Yeah. They're definitely nothing too exciting on this side. I've looked at Microsoft teams and considered using that, but I'm sort of at the point now where if, if something works, I don't really, and it's efficient enough. Why create more work for us? Yeah. 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 But, We've been using uh, zoom for years, but I just had my first Microsoft team uh, meeting uh, yesterday. Yes. Um, look, I mean, it, it looks, it looks really robust in terms of, the, the quality of the video. One thing that I've noticed because I've used quite a number of these video programs over the years is, uh, is the difference in video quality. Just, I, I'm not exactly sure how or why, but just uh, the, the video quality seems to be superior on Microsoft Teams um, yeah. than anything I've used to date. Uh, I believe, you know, there's a little bit of talk of, of Zoom and, and, and I've seen, you know, there's a bunch of sort of large um, either government or, or private, you know, institutions that are shifting off Zoom. But I don't, I'm, I'm always wary when I see something in the media, I'm thinking, wait a second, is this just, you know, is it Microsoft Teams paying some journalists, right, to write about Zoom or is it legitimate? I can never tell, right? I'm not privy to that information. So I'll, I'll, I'll reserve my judgment until sort of, I guess, something a bit more concrete comes along. Um, for our internal teams, we use a lot of uh, Marco Polo. Uh, we use a lot of Slack and email and, um, and text as well. We actually use like a whole, like many channels. And I find that many channels work well because you can pick up different conversations on different channels. So let's say we're talking about this thing a lot. And then I'll say, actually, uh, Michael over here is, uh, I'm going to start talking to you about a completely separate thing and using a different channel to talk about multiple different topics with, uh, rather than sort of talking over each other on a particular topic. And, and it was never a decision that we made. We just ended up like, we'll hit, we'll hit this channel for a while. And then all of a sudden we'll swap to this channel and it's just, uh, it's just about another topic. And then we'll hit this channel for a while. And then, and it's kind of like we jump around a bit and that might be frustrating for some people, but we've found being able to handle multiple topics, multiple conversation streams simultaneously yeah. using different channels has worked really well. Yeah, definitely. And, and the other thing is, well, they all have their different uses. So for example, what's up, what sort of got me onto it, to be honest, is that you could send voice messages to each other. So I could literally be, running around the house doing something and oh, I've got to remind, remind you know, one of my staff members to do something. I'd quickly just leave a voice message. Hey, can you please do this done? You know? So I find emails obviously better than voice if, you know, cause it's, I can track it and come back to it. But if I'm on the run or if it's something urgent, I found that really helps because man, I think I'm king of phone tag to be honest with you. <laughs> so yeah. It just saves everyone that headache. Mate, I like go check out Marco Polo. I will. Marco Polo, it, write that one down, stick it on your list to check out because it will do for you in communication what DocuSign has done for you with signatures. It's, wow. Yeah, it's really good. Highly recommend. Um, yeah, it's super easy to understand how to use and it's totally free. So I, I recommend it to everyone. Um, cool. All right. Well, let's get into operations because um, communication is definitely important, but so is operations. So like 
what tools and tips and tricks are you using to be able to run your company, um, you know, remotely? Yeah, what's your CRM, for example? CRM-wise, we part of our licensee, we've got our own CRM called Platform Plus through InFocus. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. And so, so we, in there, do you have sort of like a list of tasks that are automatically generated for each person or uh, how do you handle sort of, you know, clients going through your pipeline? Yes. Um, so with that side of things, it's... The, the, system, the CRM actually does a lot for us. Um, and that was part of the reason I actually moved over to the licensee just because it's a lot of that works in together. So when we're, the client's going through the different stages of the advice process, it sort of flags through this pipeline type of system and it shows us, uh, it gives us a bit of a reminder as to what clients and what area and how long they've been sitting there for. Um, as far as the probably the bulk of what we do with files is concerned. We use a lot of, we use Dropbox mainly um, for that. That works really well with Dropbox because um, I've, I've got the corporate account, the, the business account, which they charge an arm and a leg for. But the good thing about it is that it sort of tracks each file, what time each member, each staff members open the file, what they edited. You can go back to different versions, etc. So it's, there's a lot more security on that side of things. Um, and I do use Google Drive um, for voice notes. So with my file notes, I've started to use an app called Parrot, um, mm. where I think it's called Parrot. It's called Parrot. Yeah, it's called Parrot. And what it is is through my phone, I can actually record a voice message. So in this case, it would be a file note after a meeting. And there's a button I press where it automatically syncs that file note to Google Drive to a folder. And then from there, my PA would go in and once every week, just literally, literally listen to my voice notes and put them straight into the CRM and type them up for me. So that's, yeah, that's made a massive difference. And I use Google Drive for that literally only because Dropbox seems to have issues every time I try to link that up. But right. for us, it's yeah, Platform Plus, which I love. Um, and it's made our life so much easier um, since using it. Um, Dropbox and yeah, Google Drive through Parrot. Interesting. Um, what, what is it about Parrot? Is there anything like, for example, does it ask you questions? Can you, can you bring up unique text uh, that you can answer during the file note or is it just entirely off your head? Off my head. Entirely okay. off my head. Yeah. But it's literally just record, say what I want to say, stop record, press a button that says sync with Google drive and yep. then that's it. And it just appears in that folder. So she can go into it and um, check what she needs to. Um, awesome. A function it does have is that it lets you record phone calls if you use Android. So I haven't used it yet, but I'm assuming you'd need to tell whoever legally that the call's being recorded when you talk to them before using it. But but that's potentially something for down the track. Because Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, because I mean, especially if you said to your client, hey, how are you doing? Um, we're just recording all of our phone calls these days. Uh, just wanted to let you know, uh, just so that we have a, a clear... I guess, um, paper trail, except it's a voicemail trail, um, a voice trail. Yeah. Of everything going on. That's going to make, um, yeah. I mean, that would strongly increase efficiencies. Uh, I guess how you position that with clients, it shouldn't be too weird, but I've just never done it, but I'd be very interested to hear, you know, check in on this, uh, you know, in a year or so to see if you ended up using it. I think that'd be really interesting. Um, so, so do you, ha so you have, you use your CRM to sort of give you an idea of where each client is at in any particular case. Um, do you have an outbound um, uh, acquisition uh, piece of tech? By that, I mean, so let's, let's say Platform Plus, and I've heard really good things about it, um, handles, uh, you know, from when a client begins its, its, uh, its particular job or project that's going through until completion. But do you have another piece of software that's letting you know who your, um, who your leads are or who the people that you're conversing with, or do you have sort of a, a marketing tool or an email tool? Do you, what do you use in order to give you sort of eyesight as to what you're doing externally? Um, the good thing is platform plus does a lot of that. So, yeah, so, right. so through that, we can sort of manage, if we have leads in the system and they're not pros, you know, they're not clients yet. So if they're still prospects, we can um, send out email campaigns straight from there. Um, I do find for email campaigns, I used to use Mailchimp because I, I like their integration because it sort of shows you who's opened the email and what the success rate was. But um, I just, I've just been using platform plus lately just cause it's just easier. Cause once you've sent it out, it just records it under each client as to what they got. Yeah. Wow. So, so platform plus will even, Rec record your marketing activity. 
Yes, correct. Huh. As long as you've got each client in there. Yeah. At the moment, yeah. Interesting. Okay, cool. And how do you get new clients into Platform Plus? Is, do you, is there a tool, you know, for example, you write something on LinkedIn, you get, you know, uh, someone sort of calls in or writes you an email or whatever it is. Is there, a, is there an automatic way to get them in there or that's just a manual upload? Manual. Okay. Manual. That, yeah. That's, yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah. Um, I find the people that do the most work on automating everything have to constantly refresh the things that they're automating. So 100%. Man, I've, I've, got, I've got absolutely no problem with uh, a little bit of manual work here if and there. We had, if, we had a, um, if I was to ever do an actual, yeah, like literally an online marketing campaign where I'd be getting a high number of leads coming through, I definitely wouldn't be doing it manually. I've heard good sure. things about Pipedrive. Um, yes, pipe drive. I can definitely speak to. I've seen. Uh, I've seen that used really well. Um, the way that it is, it's 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 a very popular way of all project management these days, and it's called Kanban. I'm not sure yes. if you've ever heard that before. Yeah. So right. Kanban, you, you basically and, and pipe drive is a very simple piece of uh, software. It just says these are the ten people that I've reached out to, um, and then let's say you've got let's say you've got four columns reached out. Um, meeting contracts signed, for example, yep. and then and then at the top of each column, you've got sort of a percentage of likelihood to conversion. So in the yep. first column, you'd have zero percent. Second column, you'd have twenty five percent. Third column, fifty, seventy five, and then obviously if it keeps going, it's it's a hundred. So um, and then you would have a dollar figure attached to each client, and then as you move each client through the Kanban. It, it, let's say you, you, it's a $5,000, let's, for simplicity sake, let's say $4,000. And then, uh, you've got a, a, a working total at the end of pipe drive. Essentially, let's say you have 10 uh, people all with $4,000, but they're all in the first line. It's zero percent conversion. And then let's say five of them move across to 25%. And so you've got five times four a uh, thousand, which equals 20,000. And then you've got a 25% of that happening. So then you've got then the little number in the pipe drive down the corner will say five grand. Yep. So out of, and then as you move it across, man, it's uh, it's a really, really good sales tool. I really like it. Yeah, that is pretty cool. And to be honest with you, I'll, up until about two years ago, I wasn't very good at looking at, I think one of my weaknesses was looking at things from an overall perspective, like from a management perspective, I, I mm-hmm. should say, because, um, the way I've always thought is to just heads down, work hard, go crazy, keep doing what I'm doing, help my clients, help the business grow, etc. Yep. Um, but in the last two years, and I've always known I've had to do it, but I've just never done it. But in the last two years, I've really taken that step back and sort of looked at these types of things. Um, you know, how much revenue is coming in, how to make things more efficient. Is this really the best way to do it, etc. So it's, yeah, now more than ever, I value things like that just because, yeah, it, we hear it all the time about planning. We do it for our clients every single day. But for me, it was just, I think it's just survival mode. But I think with any business, um, they, there's always that phase at the start where they're growing and they sort of just take every client they can, do what they can, just focus on growing the business. But then it gets to that point halfway through where they either stay stagnant or they need to make changes to grow. And I think that's sort of the process or the part that I've just come out of in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's that classic work on the business v working in the business. Um, Definitely. It, yeah, it's sort of as the head of the company, moving yourself to a position where you can work on the business. Yeah, I mean, things things grow substantially quicker at that oh, yeah. stage. Um, it's just a case of you know th- there is a lot of work to get um, people to a situation or a position where they can hold up their end of the bargain and 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 I guess replicate and improve the work that you were doing previously. Yes. Um, I know Ben Nash does a lot in terms of at each at each sort of part or, or, or each implementation piece that needs to be done. Whatever uh, management software he uses, uh, he actually attaches a short video to each part of the process uh, that is recorded on Loom. And so uh, if he staff, especially if they're new staff, they come on, they know exactly, you know, where to go to learn how to implement that step. And so yeah. he has all of his um, operations set up. I mean, he's done a lot of work to get it to that point, but I mean, it's, I've seen it work really well for him. Um, okay, cool. So platform plus, it sounds like he's doing a huge part of the heavy lifting for you, which is, which is excellent. And yeah, I, I, 
that's the that's the one piece that I um, hear frequently about in focus as well is the uh, is the software is really that attractive piece yeah. and I'm glad to hear that that's the case for you as well. Um, moving on to acquisitions, what are you doing and how do you go about acquiring new clients and bringing uh, you know how do you what's your attraction mechanism to get people to knock on your door and say, Michael, I'd love to get a piece of advice from you. What, what are the, what sort of the marketing strategies you're doing from home that you find are working? Yeah, I, um, I think when I first started, I, I was, there was a company, I forgot their name now, but I was paying them a per lead basis and I was getting clients who essentially what we're Googling, looking for a financial player and they were putting me in touch with them. Um, and that worked out well. Um, but I would say in the last four years, a lot of it's just been, all of it has been word of mouth um, from clients and referral partners so accountants, um, mortgage brokers, um, lawyers as well. Um, f- for me, I've found, and I, I literally say this to my clients, even my referral partners that, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Like if somebody trusts you, if they feel good about you, they just know that whoever they send to you is going to be in safe hands. And um, I guess what I tell all my referral partners, which is literally the truth um, <laughs> where anyone that comes to me, if I can't help them, I'll at least point them in the right direction. Um, and uh, that sort of that, that's worked out really well because that way the clients, the, ref, the people that come through to me go back to their referral partners and sort of normally, well, as far as I'm concerned, every single time I've had good things to say about me. Um, and that just gives them the confidence to send more through. And the biggest part for me with that side of things, I think was um, education because what, when I first started again, literally self-employed my own business, I think I door knocked on I think I spoke to about a hundred potential referral partners in one year. Like that's literally how desperate I was to, well, not desperate. That's that, how hungry I was to sort of grow everything. Um, and within, and after a year, I think there was only about three or four that were, you know, I had built really good relationships with and they knew that I was helping their clients and vice versa. Um, and that, and I think in that, and what I learned from that is that the biggest part about it is education and also finding a referral partner that is on the same level as you. Because when I was starting off, an established accounting practice, for example, is very unlikely to refer to an advisor as just started off his own business. Whereas an accountant that's at the same level or a mortgage broker or a lawyer is more likely to refer because they'll, A, they'll receive the same number of referrals back, most likely. Um, and secondly, we can sort of work together to help each other grow. And we're most likely a lot more like-minded at that point as well. So the clients will enjoy it and appreciate it a bit more because they'll sort of see that we're singing the same song instead of talking to one person that's established and has a completely different mindset compared to another. That's a really good point. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I like the, your data points there as well. I think that's uh, one of the largest numbers I've ever heard. So you reached out to a hundred, three or four um, end up Literally working. 100. No joke. Like wow. every week, I was like, I'm going to contact four or five people. And the funny thing is, I think <laughs> of those hundred, probably seventy agreed to refer clients to me. Yes. Um, but only five of them actually did. So that's the other thing as well. Everybody will agree to, yeah, let's send clients to each other. But it's not that. It's just building that relationship. And um, that's awesome, man. That's really, really. That's. I mean, that's a huge insight. So, so not only is it finding people that are at that same, uh, I guess. Experience, maybe not experience level, but certainly in, in, uh, in terms of how, um, mature their business is. Yes. Um, I, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. And then also you mentioned education. What do you, what do you specifically mean by education? Um, ah, okay. So for example, I used to assume that an accountant knew what we did and I used to assume a lawyer knew what we did. And I used to assume that a mortgage broker knew what we did, but it, it couldn't be further from the truth because for example, the mortgage broker thinks we just do insurance. The accountant thinks we only help rich people. You know, like everybody has their own perceptions and their own experiences. But when I actually sat down and explained to them what we did, and for me, one of my main strengths, and this is actually what really helped, is helping people with cash flow and debt management. That, that was probably one of the first, more cash flow, but, but that was probably the thing that I sort of started with, with clients, um, where, and I'd, tell, I'd help them with their super and insurance, obviously, and state planning and look at it holistically, um, assuming that's the advice that they wanted and needed. But um, one of my strong points was the budgeting. And when I first started, again, I'd focus on Gen X, Gen Y clients. And I talked to them about, and I know I'm sort of moving off topic here now, but I'd sort of, I'd talk to them about their super and insurance and I'd help them consolidate their seven funds and set up their insurance and all the rest of it. 
But the biggest thing they valued was managing money and helping them structure their accounts and all these just basic things that you think would be common sense. And they are common sense. I'd literally tell clients that this is common sense, but it's just having someone look at things from a, you know, an, an object, you know, from an outsider's point of view. And through my referral partners, again, educating them on that worked out really well because they sort of knew I did super and in insurance, but they didn't know that I could help people manage their money. They didn't know that um, I could help them with their goals advice, you know, saving for a house or saving for this or whatever it may be. So I think that was a game changer because their perception was this. And when I told them what I could do and sort of how they could refer clients that helped because my main thing was to make sure they don't refer for the sake of it um, or because they think they needed it, the client needed it, but more because if there's a need that they could identify in that client and to do it in a way that they're adding value, not in a way that they're just doing it as a transactional part of their business. Yeah, man. If that makes sense, because yeah, because some people used to just refer for the sake of it. And a client would call me up not having no idea why I'm calling them. But lately it's changed where they'd be like, for example, okay, my accountant told me that you could help me manage my money, you know, or my mortgage broker told me that, yeah, you could help me out with income protection, but also look at all what I might have in super already. So I think things like that sort of made a big difference so that referral partners knew when to send clients and, and also when not to, because the other thing there that I've sort of done in the last year and a half is I've identified who I want to work with. And again, we always talk about this whole target market, um, ideal client situation. Um, and while, you know, I'll help anyone that comes my way. I sort of identified who I enjoy working with the most. And for me, it was families with kids or families in general. And, um, and from there, my USP, my unique selling proposition is literally, I help families make better financial decisions so that they can focus on the things they love. Um, and that resonates really well. And I found that ref- client, uh, I'm getting more referrals now because my referral partners know who I work with the best And I'm getting, I'm talking to clients that I love helping, um, saying that I love helping, you know, a 15 year old and a seven year old, it's no issue for me, but working with couples, I feel like I could relate to them a lot more because we have children. Um, you know, I've got five chooks, you know, there's, we, we have the same goals in a way we, we share the same struggles with time and emotionally and financially. So, and everything I tell my clients in these situations is literally 90% of the time is what I do anyway. So that works out really well as well. So I feel it's a lot more effective. And as a result, I'm getting a lot more referrals out of it because my referral partners know who I can help because when they do come up against a family or a couple, for example, straight away, they'll think of me. They'll think, yes, this is someone that Michael help. And you'd be surprised how many times when I do get the call for a referral, they'll actually, it's been happening a lot lately, but they'll say, Michael, I've got the perfect client for you ah, because they know who I like to work with compared that's to, excellent. hey, I've got someone that you can probably help. Mate, that is excellent. That's a really good outcome. Um, I like that you've sort of, um, just going with that old school word of mouth referral, just proving that it still works, um, yeah. which is fantastic. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's the oldest form of, <laughs> of marketing available and, and for a reason, you know, like uh, it's awesome to hear that it's still working. Um, do you think you'll ever explore that digital side of acquisition or, or you think you, you've kind of got this other more traditional way of client acquisition nailed so sort of like why why bother yeah no no definitely i mean what i do now is definitely not perfect and um some months are better than others you know so i'm I'm not it's um i don't want to paint a perfect picture sure so it's it's always important to diversify how clients are finding out about me and 100 percent. like for me i would love i've heard i've got a a face for radio so i'd love to start podcasts or or something along those lines it's um it's been a massive passion of mine to, to do something online for a while. Um, even if it's just writing blogs, um, just something like that, just in listening to, to be honest with you, a lot of it has come to listening to, to this podcast series, you know, like what other advisors are doing around blogs. Um, there's one about podcasts recently as well, um, yep. where, you know, you can create the content and it just stays there forever. So that's, that's massive for me. And, and I've got a lot to say and I've got a lot. And I love if, if I've got something that can help someone, just like when I reached out to you, if I've got someone that I can help someone with, I love spreading it, you know? So it's, uh, it's the best medium I think to do that. 
Mate, I yeah, highly recommend podcasts. Um, literally, Spotify uh, have put five hundred million dollars allocated towards building out their podcast streaming. Um, so yeah. they they obviously see it as a huge part of their future. Um, it is still just getting started. Um, it, it's it's kind of hilarious. Like even though podcasting technically started, I think around sort of like that early. 2000 i can't remember his name there's some guy called the pod father you know oh, and then um yeah, I and, his name. yeah and then uh, sort of you know like but really i guess joe rogan in a lot of ways That's put right. it on the on joe the rogan. map um he started in 2007 okay. and while he while he's considered you know like the the bro oprah or the broper right so like he's just you know like he's he's a fighter or a former fighter he's, he openly says he's got brain damage he smoked a lot of marijuana throughout that, you know, I think he's probably at about 1500 at this stage episodes. Wow. Um, but he, he's turned into just this juggernaut and he really did put podcasting on the map. And when, when we started XY podcast, we didn't even know what, well, I, none of us had ever even listened to a podcast and we were just doing webinars. And then we thought, Oh, actually, if we record the webinar, then we'll be able to send it to people later. And then we're putting it on YouTube and going, oh, actually, what's this podcast? And then we just stripped out the audio and stuck it and figured out how to launch a podcast. And then we went, oh, wow, instead of, you know, 60 people on a webinar, we're getting, well, now 8,000 a month, right? Wow. So it's like, you know, it's, it, this on-demand consumption of content is just, it's, it, it's a much better way it's fits in with people's lifestyles a lot more. I will say it's actually interestingly, since this pandemic, um, our listenership has gone down about 15%. Wow. And I think it's because you know, people are going to work at, at any log, you know, like, so yeah, they're not in the car. They're not in the car. They're not sort yeah. of stuck on the train. They're, we're not, it's, it's kind of hilarious. Ali just sort of pieced that together in the last week or two. And I was like, Hey, wait a second. Why have we got a bit of a downturn? And it sort yep. of dawned on me. Um, yeah. So highly recommend, man. I, I think, um, there's surprisingly, and I will say this is a surprise, uh, there's not, as far as I could tell, a lot of family-based financial planning podcasts. A lot nice. of it's dedicated to the younger stuff and a lot, of, a lot of it's dedicated to entrepreneurialism. A lot of it's dedicated. But as far as like, hey, family, do you care about money? There's not a lot on there. And I think, you know, I think you do a really good job, man. Um, if anything, I, you know, you're like me, your face is definitely meant for radio so uh at the at the very least you know where you you uh will be comfortable um I, on, that, on that note i'm also halfway through writing a book as well woo. so yeah but for see has sort of held that up a little bit uh, you know and getting that already and now this whole pandemic sort of put it on the back burner but um dude yeah just just another example of something that will be there forever and it, it's a very easy book like it's a, it's an easy read i'm not an author i'm not i'm not a scholar i've got to be honest with you, my spelling is terrible. Uh, it's just, um, yeah, it's something that people will help. And it's literally, it's targeted towards couples, financial planning for couples. and That's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, a, a really good, I'm not sure if you have, have you sort of looked into the best way to um, write a book or do you have someone helping you do it? Um, no, I went, to a, I went to a seminar about two years ago. Okay. Um, and I got a lot out of that, about structure and all the rest of it. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so that sort of helped a lot. And I guess the theory behind it is no one throws out a book, but people throw out business cards. So if you sort of give yeah. someone a book, um, they're very unlikely to throw it out. They're either going to give it to a friend or leave it in, on the shelf. No, mate, I, I 100%. Um, yeah, so I, the, as long as it sounds like you're already on that path, doing a book pitch is like a really good, so you write, um, you sort of write the titles of the chapters and you split the book up into the, the categories that you want to do it. Um, it, yeah, it took me 18 months, uh, to, to push out the book that I published back in 2016. And it was nice. one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. So I'm What's it not, called? Uh, it's called fund your ideal lifestyle. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was really difficult. Now it was really, really difficult to write, but, uh, yeah, uh, eventually I'll do another one when I've actually got something else to say. Um, Mate, so thank you so much for coming on. There's only one sort of thing that I wanted uh, you to leave the audience with. And that was your view of how we can turn this current sort of situation where we're sort of staring at the face of an impending recession. Um, you know, obviously the market's dropped quite substantially. It's bouncing back a little bit, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's clearly down. We don't know how far it's going to go down. Um, but you like an absolute legend and something I really respect 
respect in people is when they find the positives. And we were talking about that before we started the podcast. What, what's kind of a message that you want to leave with advisors and, you know, people in general? Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess this applies to advisors, but even everyone in general. And I sort of worked it out when I was just literally talking to a client the other week about it. And they were down on the whole situation and the recession that we're in at the moment. But I guess coming out of something like this, 80% of people are most likely going to be casualties. You know, they're going to come out weaker or less confident, whether it's financially or emotionally. Uh, But there's that 20% that will actually make the most of it and grow and take advantage of opportunities. And I think if we could work towards being that 20%, um, this this whole pandemic could potentially be the best thing that's ever happened to us. So whether it's us as advisors, um, finding new ways to, deal with clients, to contact clients, um, you know, to, uh, there's been no, I don't, I don't think financial advice in a long time has ever been at the top of minds, the top, top of mind for, for Australians um, or help or sort of sorting out their finances. So I think now is there's an opportunity for us to help people and to communicate that with clients and sort of to show them what we can do. Um, and I think from a everyday person's perspective um it's literally just again trying to take advantage of opportunities and instead of feeling like they're the, i know it's easier said than done but instead of victimizing the situation trying to use it as an opportunity so if someone that's lost their job for example that can't work try to think of that business idea that they tried to develop five years ago or, or that way to to take that leap to being self-employed because normally when you're in a safe and secure job it's really hard to take that jump um, for somebody that is doing well financially, leverage le- leverage the current situation, um, whether it's financially or through opportunities to sort of look at different markets and look at where you could sort of invest where you haven't invested before or or the type of or maybe try to talk to different types of clients or potential customers that you've never spoken to before. Um, if there's anything of, you know, from the GFC, well, I first started advising just after the GFC, but talking to clients that went through the GFC, that's sort of what I saw that 80% of them would say, Oh, I lost so much money in the GFC. Oh yeah. My super balance halved and blah, blah, blah. But they don't realize that it since went up anyway, but still, (laughs) um, but then you've got those 20% of clients where they tell me how much money they made during the GFC where they invested into this area or they expanded the business. or they went from, you know, in this, like there's there's a, I think there's a few success stories at the moment of different businesses that have gone from, being face to face to just doing deliveries and some are actually making more money now doing deliveries and they've just adapted to, to the climate. So I, I think that's the, the biggest thing I could leave there just to take advantage of the situation, not be one of the casualties and just try to work at what you can do to make the most of the situation. Um, because I know for us, there's so much opportunity. Like it's for finances from my experience. When I speak to somebody that's maybe never had a financial advisor before one of the first things they'll say is they just never got around to seeing a financial plan, even though they know they needed to get their money sorted or their super or whatever it may be. Um, and I think now being at the, that now that this issue is at the top of people's minds, um, we can be there to help them and we can be there to sort of guide them through this process and hopefully make a massive, massive difference in the world. So yeah, that's, that's my thing. And uh, not saying that I'll do it perfectly, but I'm, I'm definitely trying my best. Awesome, man. No, it's really good. I mean, whenever people are putting forward positive messages, huge fan, I think it's exactly what we need. And yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. Uh, X, Y itself, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're, we've received a little bit of a, an uptick in, um, in, you know, people coming on and looking at what we're doing. And uh, we're, we're actually having, because uh, our revenue is, you know, as an advertising model, we deal with sort of big brands. And um, yeah, we're actually people are looking more to us than ever before because nice. ev- while everyone else has sort of had to cancel their events, you know, we're on the flip side, we've sort of launched a digital event series. So um, yeah, in a lot of ways, this is going to work uh, well for us and, and, and we're, we're hopefully going to be in that 20%. And, and could I just say as well, something else I forgot to mention is um, being in isolation, I think has made us appreciate things that we've never appreciated before and things that were a big deal aren't really a big deal anymore. For, for example, six months ago, if we didn't get that car that we wanted or if we didn't get that, uh, if we didn't go to that restaurant that we really wanted to go to, or if we hadn't been out for two weeks, we'd get depressed or upset or frustrated, you know, whereas it's funny now that being in isolation, we're starting to appreciate the small things where even just going out with some friends for a drink or even just, I don't know, even just going to a shopping center, um, you know, suddenly has become something that we're starting to miss. So I think, 
again, taking advantage of the situation is if we can sort of appreciate the smaller things, um, whether it's a family spending more time with their kids uh, or couples spending more time with each other. I was assuming they're still married after this whole isolation thing. Um, <laughs> but um, if people can take advantage of that, sorry, appreciate that more, um, coming out of this whole pandemic, hopefully they could move forward with a different mindset as well. Because I think, I think that's, for us, it's been a massive game changer. Like we didn't realize how many fun things we could do in the backyard with the kids. Whereas now we've discovered these things that we should be doing. So coming out of it, we're probably going to be spending more home time together. And couples that never saw each other because of work or because they put, you know, their jobs before anything else could now sort of appreciate each other a lot more as well. So, um, yeah. And again, that's sort of, that stems back to what I said about coming out of this as that 20%, not as that, not as that 80%. That's awesome. Um, for any advisor out there that wants to reach out and say hi, um, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Yeah. LinkedIn, LinkedIn, please just add cool. me on LinkedIn. Um, send me a message. Um, and, yeah, more than happy to chat to anyone, more than happy to help anyone. Um, one last point I forgot to mention before is working from home to make sure that you've got a good environment around you. That, that was another big thing. For example, a lot of people will currently be doing work still in their kitchen because I don't have a home office, but setting something up where you can be away from everything it is massive. Like uh, it just comes to mind now because I've got a desk called, it's like a stand, one of those stand up desks. Yeah. So I'm using that at the moment. And that's, that's made a massive difference just being able to stand up and have that environment at home. So, but you're happy to touch base with anyone, help anyone out. Um, especially those that are going through any types of struggles. Hopefully I can assist. I definitely, I definitely don't know everything and I'm not perfect, but um, if I can help, I'm always there to do it. Awesome. Michael, thank you so much for uh, giving me your time today, mate. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Cheers.